Well, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to Bible Bite. Welcome to those watching on YouTube. Hope you're comfortable wherever you are, or if you're watching later. Um, hope you really enjoy connecting with our Bible study. We're going through the book of Jeremiah, not verse by verse exactly, but um, in sections and uh, looking at the broad content of this amazing book of prophecy from a very long time ago. And um, it's fireworks day, isn't it? So um, we have an explosive subject today, <laughs> and that is God's judgment and his wrath. So not an easy one by any means at all. So um, please pray as I go with this. And uh, we're going to be exploring Jeremiah 25. And um, I'm not going to read, we're not going to read the whole text because there's a lot of it, but I want to walk through it. So you might like to have a Bible handy when we come to that in just a moment. But I'm going to begin with some words from Psalm 145, because I thought it would just help set the tone a little bit. Because the scripture says, God is slow to anger and abounding in love. Yeah? He says that in more than one place. It's several. It's all over the Bible, really. God is slow to anger and abounding in love. And Psalm 145 and begins with this, well, it, it, can, it says a few more things than that. But let me just read those words to you now. Have you got them on the screen or not, Christopher? Don't worry if you haven't. Psalm 145. 8 to 13. By the wonders of technology, it can all come up in a flash. Verse 8 is the key one. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, or gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. All your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful people extol you. They tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might, so that all people may know your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures through all generations. I thought that was just beautiful. It sets the context for us, doesn't it, as we consider difficult material. The, the truth is God is sovereign. He is supreme over all things. And deep down inside, compassionate, kind, caring, slow to anger and rich in love. But he's a holy God, is he not? And um, holiness requires things to be right. So we're going to begin with that great hymn, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the afternoon, our song shall rise to the, you can sing what you like, but um, you think of it, I mean it's morning in the USA at the moment, and we'll be praying for them in just a sec, boy do they need it. So please stand if you're able, and let's sing together this wonderful hymn. <laughs>
Do take a seat. It was in Isaiah chapter 6 when Isaiah is called by the Lord. He has that vision, doesn't he? Seeing the throne of God and the cherubim singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. He's not once holy, he's not twice holy, but three times it has to be said just to get the point across. God is a holy God. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that in a world that is marred by all kinds of rubbish and darkness and things that are are wrong, you are a God who is just and upright and true. And we thank you for that. We thank you that we have one we can totally rely upon, for you are our great and glorious King. Thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you that we can put our trust in you today. Thank you for that reminder from the psalm that you are good, compassionate and gracious towards us. And yet you cannot tolerate sin and wickedness. And so you have to deal with it. Thank you that we meet in the name of Jesus who came to deal with it once and for all and opened a way for us to receive mercy and grace and forgiveness from you. And for that we're so thankful. And we invite you to speak into our midst today. Would you speak in power by your spirit? Minister to our hearts as we grapple with difficult material today. Help us to see through the difficult stuff, to see the truth of your light shining in the darkness. And as we pray today, we are very conscious of world events and particularly the significance of the election happening across the pond And we pray for the people of the United States of America as they, well, many have already voted, but we commit to you the overall outcome of this election. We really don't know quite what to pray, but we trust this great nation into your loving care, that you will guide and lead and bring the right person for this season into the place of authority. And Lord, we know that this has massive significance with the particular influence that America has across world events. So we pray that you would work through this something beautiful and wonderful. And some of the things that we're struggling with in the world today, Lord, we pray that the outcome of this election would help resolve some of those things, that the world will come together to address issues that are causing such grief and heartache in the world. And it's Remembrance Sunday this weekend. We're very conscious of the pain and anguish of what happened in the wars here and the effect it had on many, many people, some of whom are present today, who lived through some of that. Father God, we pray for all who are still carrying the wounds of war, whether that be 80 years ago or more recently. And as we think about the consequences of sin and wickedness and the way that it leads often to conflict and to wars. Lord, we pray for peace in our generation. We pray for the nations that are in turmoil at the moment. And for all who carry those wounds of war, whether they be current or long-seated in their memories, Lord God, would you bring healing? Would you do something beautiful through the Prince of Peace, our Lord Jesus Christ? Pour out your Spirit and Wherever your church is today, may they be good news people in what can be so often a bad news world. May the light of Jesus shine through us and bring hope, we pray. Some of you know um, Noma, who was here from Zimbabwe. Um, She went to an assessment conference for people from other countries who were applying for ministry in the United Reformed Church. Good news. She's just got a letter saying she's been accepted, which is wonderful. So um, that would mean that she will go onto the list of ministers available to be called to a pastorate. So we need to pray that somebody would call her to be a minister in their church and then she would move into a position of being a stipendary minister like myself, serving in a church, housed for, with her family and looked after with all the immigration stuff as well that you know, need to work in through. So... Praise the Lord. We thank you for this wonderful good news for Noma. She was watching on Sunday. If you're watching today, Noma, our love goes out to you and the family. We are rejoicing with you. 
that this is good news that opens the way for you to serve in this country. And Lord, we do pray that you would lead this family to the place that you've got lined up for them, that there would be a place where they can serve as a family and be a great, a great inspiration and help to the congregations in whatever area that is. Thank you, Lord, for looking after these dear friends. Thank you that we can stand with them from a distance and continue to uphold and pray for them in the next chapter of their lives. So thank you, Jesus, for your goodness. We rejoice. And we pray for the church across our nation that you will go on building up the body of Christ, that you would demolish barriers that separate us and bring us closer together as we seek to follow Jesus and be his people today. And as we always do, we give a moment to pray for anybody who's needing God's healing touch today. We particularly remember Pauline in hospital and Vivian and Heather. We pray for Pat, who uh, had a, a problem with her back, which doesn't seem to be quite as bad as she first feared. So thank you for that, Lord. And we trust her to you. And we pray for Beryl as she goes to the hospital on Friday for a, a further appointment and examination. And I do pray for dear Megan, who was a young person in this church, who is now married and just had a baby and the baby's got needs of surgery as a tiny little baby and with a heart issue. So we pray for little baby Sebastian in his first week of life. And we pray for Megan and Sam as they rejoice in the birth, this miracle child. Every baby's like a miracle. Um, but we're, we're heart feeling for them um, with the anguish of um, him needing surgery very, very soon. So bless them. And look after them, we pray today. If there's anyone you're concerned for, just take a moment to pray for them. We just also lift you, um, Liz, whose mother, they had a memorial service in Roxall this morning for her. And we thank you for this lovely lady who helped with our Caterpillar group for 10 years. And we just commend the family to you as they miss her so much. But thank you for the memories and all that she meant to them. Be with all who mourn, all of us who miss dear loved ones today. In Jesus' name. Amen. I always think of my parents at this time of year because my dad was born on the 4th of November and my mum on the 6th and they were two days apart in age as well and I always used to say there was fireworks between my parents <laughs> which was the truth but happy memories I was very blessed to have caring and loving parents okay if you want to turn to Jeremiah 25. Christopher's going to try and follow through roughly and keep up with me as I go, but you might just want to browse across the text while I'm speaking. I'm not going to read all of it. I will read sections as we go, and I'm going to kind of walk through it, if you're with me, because I think it's that kind of passage that will be helpful to be pursued in that manner today. Before we go into that, you might just like to turn to the front cover of the Bible, um, just inside. You'll see if you turn it round 90 degrees, there's a map right, right on the, the actual cardboard cover. And uh, there are three maps there, but the left-hand map is of the Holy Land in that season, the Old, the Old Testament kind of period. And as we read it and nations are mentioned, you may just find it helpful just to look at that because sometimes you think, where on earth is Edom? You know, I think we know where Philist Philistia is, particularly Gaza. But then Tyre and Sidon are up the coast to the northwest and then down in the bottom there's other places. So just um, be aware that's there if um, when we read and make mention of particular places, a map is helpful, is it not? I did geography as a 
key subject in my studies. And of course, Ed here was a geography specialist and taught it, didn't you? And you taught people how to teach it back in the day. And he went to Canada and taught people how to do geography. So, But maps are good, aren't they, Ed? We need maps. I could study a map for hours. Janet would always say, don't give him a map. You won't see him for another hour. It's just one of those things, isn't it? Some of us, you know, sat and are fine, but I like to know where I'm going. <laughs> yeah. I think the Bible's a bit like a map as well sometimes. We like to know where we're going, don't we? And some of that's perhaps in the text today, but some of it is very thick and difficult to find our way through. So I'm kind of warning you there. But we started with thinking about Isaiah and that sense of the holiness of God. And what was his response? Woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. He immediately knew, the, the prophet Isaiah, this is, that he could not be in the presence of God. Because God is holy and he was not. Simon Peter, when the miraculous catch of fish, what happened? He falls to his knees before the Lord Jesus. And what does he say? Go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. He just knew that he wasn't worthy. And the Lord had to do something about sin, didn't he? He provided a means of sacrifices. An animal would be sacrificed as an offering to stand it kind of in the place, instead of the people of Israel having to, to die for their sins, an animal stood in the gap. Poor thing. Its life was given up. Its blood was shed. And through that, atonement was made. Forgiveness of sins was offered. And of course, as Christians, we look at the cross and are reminded that ultimately Jesus sent his son to be like that, that sin offering, to open the gap for us to know God and for our sins not to block that relationship and get in the way to restore a broken relationship to bring reconciliation and allow us to call God our father so that's setting a little bit of the context let's dip into chapter 25 and as I say I'm going to walk through some key points because it is a pretty crucial chapter and it's interesting like last week and this chapter has a very specific time frame the word came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, which was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. So we all know immediately that we're talking about 605 BC, don't we? <laughs> of course we don't. <laughs> but that's one of the few places in the Bible, you know, that you can really nail it. I mean, there were never any dates given because it was all based on which king was... I mean, BC didn't exist, did it, until when when there was Jesus. And even then, it's not actually necessarily the right date. Because nobody's quite sure. But somewhere around that time. So we started a calendar, didn't we? And that's how it kind of works. So we talk in terms of the years before Christ. And that was the year, 605, according to our calculations. And what happened in that year was that Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon, or Chaldea, as it's otherwise known, he overran the Egyptians, who were the kind of people in power at the time. They had sway across the whole region. And there was a battle at a place called Karchemish, assuming that's how you pronounce it. And as a result of that, things began to change. Although Nebuchadnezzar's dad died back in Babylon, so he had to go home and do what you do when your parents needed sorted out. So there was a kind of gap between that and when he continued perhaps some of the other taking over nations in that region. So it was a little bit of a, a gap after that. But this is when the word of the Lord came, it says. And he'd spoken the word, it says in the next verse, for 23 years, from the 13th year of Josiah, son of Amon, king of Judah, until this very day, the word of the Lord's come to me, but what? You would not listen. Can you imagine 23 years of trying to get a message across to people and constantly... Them not receiving it. 23 years suggests, of course, by our calculations that Jeremiah's ministry began in 627 BC, if I've done my maths right. He prophesied the exile. In this passage, we'll find in a moment, he prophesied them going into exile 20 years or so before it actually happened. He saw it and he spoke about it and people quaked and opposed him as we've seen as we journey through. 
And in verse 4, 5, 6, the Lord has sent prophets to you again and again, and you've not listened. Not just me, he's saying, it's been happening before. They said, turn now each of you from your evil ways, your evil practices, and you can stay in the land the Lord gave you and your ancestors forever. Do not follow other gods to serve and worship them. Do not arouse my anger with what your hands have made. In other words, idols, (laughs) false gods. Then I will not harm you. But you didn't listen. You've aroused my anger. You've brought this harm upon yourself says the Lord in verse 7. So that's a bit of the backdrop. And then in verse 8 and 9, the Lord declares that he's summonsing a people from the north and his servant Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Isn't that incredible? That Nebuchadnezzar from this evil regime in Babylon effectively is the servant of the Lord at this point. He was not, it wasn't a mistake. God says, I caused this to happen. He's serving my purposes at this time. And that's a very uncomfortable thought, isn't it? That God can use our enemies sometimes to put us right. Not only to bring disaster on this land, but it also says, and surrounding nations. So there's kind of judgment going on uh, among the nations around the nation of Judah as well. Of course, you may remember that the northern kingdom of Israel had fallen about 100 years earlier to the Assyrians. So the area that we might call Samaria and that northern part had already disappeared. Those tribes had dissolved and um, all kinds of syncretism began to happen. That's why the Samaritans were despised by the people of Jerusalem in the days of Jesus because you know, when people settled back in that land, it was kind of a bit mixed up rather than pure Judaism. That's another story, but there we go. The nations around Judah are addressed towards the end of Jeremiah. In fact, chapters 46 to 51 are oracles against the nations. I'm not intending to to cover those when we get to that point in the book, because I think we'll have probably had enough of all this stuff. But it's interesting. They get listed here in just a moment. We'll find them in uh, verses um, 18 onwards. We'll come to that in a moment. But there's a long oracle against different nations in those final chapters of the book of Jeremiah. Not final, the last chapter is about the fall of Jerusalem in chapter 52. But there is this uncomfortable story that God is bringing his servant from the north, although Babylon was actually to the east, if you look at the map. Um, They used to come round the top of the desert, it was the main trade route, so like the Assyrians did coming from the north, that boiling pot tipping over. Do you remember the vision of chapter 1? And Jeremiah saw it prophetically in his mind's eye. This is what was going to happen. And eventually the Babylonians invaded them. And the people would be banished from the land, verse 10 and 11, make that clear. And the beautiful, lovely things that happened there, the voices of bride and bridegroom, the millstones turning and sounds of joy and gladness, all of that was going to kind of disappear tragically and verse 11 tells us this whole country will become a desolate wasteland wasteland these nations will serve the king of babylon for 70 years that's pretty well a whole generation dying out and that happened in the wilderness for 40 years didn't it because god was judging the people who were always moaning and didn't believe so he said well you're not going to get there you're offspring will inherit the promise not you 70 years pretty well hardly anybody would have returned but notice in verse 12 when the 70 years are fulfilled i will punish the king of babylon and the nation and the land of the babylonians for their guilt so even though the lord was using them he's ultimately going to put them right Though he used them for his purposes, they will be punished because of their wickedness. And indeed, it's spelt out further in verse 13 and 14. I will bring on that land all the things I've spoken against it, all that are written in this book and prophesied by Jeremiah against all the nations. They themselves will be enslaved by many nations and great kings. I will repay them according to their deeds and the work of their hands. So, for a season... 
they were in the ascendancy. 70 years is a long time, more than a lifetime for most human beings, isn't it? But judgment was going to fall. What actually happened, King Cyrus conquered Babylon in 539 BC. I'm going to test you at the end on all the dates. He killed King Belshazzar, who was the last ruler of the Babylonian Empire. And you might remember, if you're familiar with the book of Daniel, in chapter 5, Belshazzar sees the writing on the wall, yeah? And uh, Daniel interprets what it says. Your time's up. That's a summary, (laughs) paraphrase. But that's tied up with this, isn't it? That's what happened later on. Jeremiah's prophecy came true. The great king of Babylon, the empire fell. And another empire, Cyrus, the great, the Persian, the Mede, took over. And indeed, he allowed the exiles to return. That's another story for another day. But some powerful stuff um, follows on. I was intending, intending originally, get me teeth right, to look really at verse 15 onwards. So I've given you that bit as a bonus. <laughs> because I've been following a particular guide that looks at the kind of prophetic pictures in Jeremiah. And the picture here is of the cup. And obviously we have the cup at Holy Communion. But the cup that we see here, as the heading suggests, is the cup of God's wrath. And this is where we get really uncomfortable. And verses 15 to 29, pretty well, are address, Yahweh addresses his prophet. He's telling Jeremiah what to be saying. And this connects with the verses that have gone before. But it also connects with those later chapters of Judgment on the Nations, 46 to 51. And remember, he was called not just to be a prophet to Judah, but to be a prophet to the nations. That was part of his original commissioning in chapter 1. So verses 16 and 17 tell us about this cup, 15, 16, 17. Take from my hand this cup filled with the the wine of my wrath, and make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. When they drink it, they will stagger and go mad because of the sword I will send among them. So we got this portrayal of this drinking cup, and uh, this was a pretty common way of speaking about this kind of thing, actually, in in the day. It doesn't make a lot of sense to us. We don't talk about offering somebody a, a cup and drinking it. It's like you're... This is your lot, effectively. That's the kind of language we would use. We've got another object lesson here, a picture that helps us focus in on something. And this cup suggests a kind of drunkenness that's, I suppose, symbolic of a sinful state, really. People reeling under their sin, staggering around, going mad. Verse 27 picks it up similarly. The God of Israel says, drink, get drunk and vomit. Am I allowed to say that in church? It's in the Bible. Fall and rise no more. Because of the sword, I will send among you. I think the sword makes more sense to us, doesn't it, about what's coming for the people. But the cup of God's wrath is there. And you'll find it once or twice in other parts of Scripture. Let me just quote a couple. Psalm 75, verse 8. In the hand of the Lord is a cup full of foaming wine mixed with spices, He pours it out, and all the wicked of the earth drink it down to its very dregs. It's very like this, isn't it? Psalm 75, that's a psalm of Asaph, not a psalm of David, but it should, in theory, come from a long way before this time of Jeremiah. And it says in the previous verse, it is God who judges. That's the context for this cup in Psalm 75. And then in Isaiah 51 and verse 17... Awake, awake, rise up, Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath, you who have drained it to its dregs, the goblet that makes people stagger. Very similar, isn't it? Same kind of language. This this goblet, this cup of God's wrath causes people to reel and stagger. There's other language about the cup in Habakkuk 2 and Lamentations 4, but not particularly about judgment there. Although it may well mean that, but it doesn't expressly say the cup of God's wrath. And of course, Gethsemane. 
Jesus, this cup, Lord. And in the book of Revelation. We'll come on to those in a minute. Hold that thought. And I hope we'll just get there without it taking too long. But it's really important we connect with those New Testament places because they help us make sense, I hope, of some of these things. The bottom line in this is those who offend the Lord must drink from his cup, must face him effectively and swallow. We sometimes talk about it, don't we, swallowing something. I wondered whether my reading of that psalm at the beginning was kind of <laughs> a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down, <laughs> sweetening us up to think about God and his goodness and his being slow to anger before we face the fact that actually he is a God of justice. We haven't got on our system actually the song Ascribe Greatness to Our God, the rock whose work is perfect and all his ways are just. It's inspired from the book of Deuteronomy, I believe, as I recall. So, here we have it. The cup. And Jeremiah is told to take it from the Lord's hand, verse 17, and make all the nations he's sent to drink from it. This It's not literal, is it? This is symbolic language of offering this cup and saying, you guys... You've got to drink this. This is what God is bringing to you. And it begins with Jerusalem and Judea. Isn't that terrible? Interestingly, all the nations that do appear later on in chapters 46 to 51 appear here among the list of nations that are about to come up, except Damascus. They get a particular mention later, but they're for some reason not in this section of the letter but there are quite a few other places that are mentioned here that aren't addressed in the later chapters. Just telling you that for information. I hope it's of some interest to one or two of you. But it starts with Jerusalem. Isn't this the awful thing that God is judging his own people? Sometimes it starts at home, doesn't it? We're often looking for everybody else to get sorted out. And God's interested in what's going on in our hearts, in our places. Jerusalem and all the towns of Judah, its kings and officials, to make them a ruin and an object of scorn and horror, a curse, as they are today. That's interesting, isn't it? It suggests that some of that is already actually happening at the time. And if this was written you know, before the fall of Jerusalem, as it suggested, then there must have been a sense in which that was already kind of being forced upon them. People were looking on them as poor old Jerusalem and Judea, you know, your time is up. Although they hadn't fallen and still believed that God was going to look after them, the shame was apparent already, it seems, according to that verse, as it is today. And then mention of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. He, of course, was the first one to fall to uh, Nebuchadnezzar. And all the foreigners that he got in that land, He'd actually captured quite a few and brought them there, a bit like the Babylonians would later do. They would all be judged, we're told. And then the Philistines, this is the western part, including Gaza, you'll notice in verse 20. The people of Ashkelon, Gaza, Ekron. And also the people left at Ashdod. What does that mean? It's like a remnant, really. Ashdod was actually wiped out by the Egyptians after a big siege. So there was only a bit of it left. Um, interestingly, there were five Philistine towns. There's another one called Gath, which isn't mentioned specifically in the text here. But in general, there's this broad statement. All these places are going to be judged. Then verses 21, Edom, Moab and Ammon. These are places to the east, if you look at the map, right down the eastern border of Judah and to the south. And then the kings of Tyre and Sidon, which is up top, northwest, on the coast. Those places, of course, feature in the New Testament as well. Paul visited um, and sailed from the ports there. And that's an area called Phoenicia. And all these places are being judged by the Lord. But then when we get to verse 23, 24, 25 and so on, there's a whole list of places. Dedan, Zimar, Timar, Buzz, not light year, I don't think. And all who are in distant places all the kings of Arabia and all the kings of the foreign people who live in the wilderness, 
people on the fringes. That's a debatable um, piece of translation apparently there. All the kings of Zimri, Elam and Media and all the kings of the north, near and far, one after the other, all the kingdoms on the face of the earth. Wow. God's not happy. And this is pretty well all the known world. Jeremiah didn't know any more. <laughs> you know, these were pl- he hadn't been to any of these places, but in you know, a reputation, you know, word flies, doesn't it? People tell. It was a lot of, um, you know, people didn't have stuff in writing in those days. It was a, very much a verbal passing on culture, and people learnt about all these places. And there's a whole list of them there. Interesting, these Buzz and Zimri are not known <laughs> at all. Nobody's a clue what those places are referred to. So ancient are these writings, aren't they? We're talking about, you know, hundreds of years before the time of Jesus. All the known world is facing God's judgment, all the kingdoms on the face of the earth. And then finally, after all of them, the king of Shishak will drink it too. If you look down to the footnote, you'll see that Shishak is a cryptogram for Babylon. People like puzzles. Anybody been watching um, Ludwig um, with David, what's his name? It's been quite fascinating, hasn't it? But this was a kind of way that Hebrew people sometimes disguise things, a form of encoded message in the Hebrew language, um, sometimes called an atbash. I'd never heard that word before. It was in my commentary. I had to look it up. But essentially, it's um, if you start from the beginning of the alphabet and the letter B is the second one in, well, you go to the end of the alphabet and it will be a Y. Are you with me? So you come the wrong way down the alphabet and it's like a form of code. And for some reason, the name of Babylon is not explicit here, but this was a fairly common cryptogram name for Babylon. And you think, why is it there? Was it being deliberately disguised? Well, if you turn to chapter 51 and verse 41, you'll see it appears again but alongside the name Babylon. So it's certainly not being in any way hidden. It was maybe just used for poetic license. Or some see, you know, because there's a mystery about it, you're very aware that Babylon appears in the book of Revelation. And it's not the literal Babylon, is it? Because it didn't exist in the time of Jesus and John the Apostle. You know, it was code (laughs) for evil place, maybe Rome. (laughs) Maybe in John's mind that's what he thought it was about, but we don't know. But it speaks of the great city falling, crashing down, and it seems to resonate with this. We'll come on to that again in a bit. But the name there, Shishak, drinks from the cup, and this is ultimately Babylon itself drinking. And I suppose if you go back up to verse 12, 13, and 14, you know, the fact that after 70 years of exile... Babylon's going to fall. This is them getting their comeuppance, their turn to drink from the same cup. So that section seems to be talking about what's going to happen when Babylon overruns that whole region and all those countries and nations suffer. Maybe not quite as far as extreme as some of the places on the um, Arabian Peninsula and so on, but actually the Babylonian Empire covered a massive area, the whole of that kind of region. But certainly not to the ends of the earth. (laughs) But that's poetic language, isn't it? So often the Bible talks about all and everything. Luke does that in his Gospel. Everyone did this. Everyone did that. Well, it wasn't absolutely everyone. But the ends of the earth, well, that includes anywhere that was known to the people. God was not happy and he was judging. But indeed, Babylon, who thought they were winning, would one day themselves fall. And then 27 to 29... The Lord speaks directly to Jeremiah again. This is what the God of Israel says, Drink, get drunk, vomit, fall to rise no more because of the sword I'll send among you. But they'll refuse to take the cup from your hand and drink it. So tell them. This is what the Lord Almighty says, You must drink it. See, I'm beginning to bring disaster on the city that bears my name. Where's that? It's got to be Jerusalem, isn't it? the place where God chose for his name to dwell, they're going to have to drink this cup of God's wrath. And you will indeed. Will you indeed go unpunished? That's a question. And then he says, 
you will not go unpunished, for I am calling down a sword on all who live on the earth, declares the Lord Almighty. Not just on them, but actually his judgment falling on the sin of all people who are not living in the way that he desires. It's very uncomfortable stuff. This is about the holiness of God, isn't it? And the sinfulness of human beings. And then the the rest of the chapter, 30 to the end pretty well, is direct prophecy in a poetic style, continuing the theme of universal judgment. Happy theme that it is. All who live on the earth, it speaks about, to the ends of the earth. I'm not going to read it all through. Judgment on all mankind, God putting the wicked to the sword, disaster spreading from nation to nation. It says there in verse 22, a mighty storm rising from the ends of the earth. And the language, the Lord roaring from on high, that's the picture of a lion roaring, isn't it? And In fact, the lion is explicitly mentioned um, in verse 38. Like a lion, he will leave his lair. Of course, the lion of Judah, we find in the book of Revelation, God roaring like a lion is in Amos and in the book of Hosea, I can give you chapter and verse if you're interested not only does he roar but he thunders from his holy dwelling that's language of Sinai isn't it the Lord thundering on the mountain God speaking out of the cloud and his message I will bring judgment on mankind the Lord will bring charges against the nations this is a picture again of a kind of lawsuit and we had that back in chapter 2 I will bring charges against you. What are the charges? You've dug your own cisterns and you've refused the spring of living water that I've given you. That was back in chapter 2. It's like this kind of law court image. He's standing and the nations stand before him as judge and have to face the music. Very, very uncomfortable. So what do we do with all of this here, the other side of the cross as we look back? 260 odd years, sorry, 2,600 years after the time of Jeremiah. Well, verses 1 to 14 that we began with clearly seem to refer to the exile and the people of God going into exile in Babylon. And 15 to 26, those verses with all the nations listed, very much connect with that, ending up with Shishak or Babylon coming to an end themselves. After all the rest, that seems to be the judgment happening for them having conquered that that region they themselves would fall but judgment to the ends of the earth seems to be a little bit more doesn't it than just in jeremiah's day and verse 33 is interesting having said some stuff poetically this is more like a piece of prose in the middle at that time those slain by the lord will be everywhere from one end of the earth to the other they will not be mourned or gathered up or buried but will be be like dung lying on the ground. It's just a horrible image, isn't it? We've probably seen some awful images of war from around the world where corpses lie on the ground. It's just horrible to think about. But it's there in the word of God. At that time, what time are we talking about? What's the time frame? We don't know precisely. But maybe it's looking ahead. Maybe it's anticipating the final judgment that the Bible talks about. So how do we respond to a tough chapter like this? Close it, run away, and pretend it's not there? Some of us are tempted, aren't we, to rip out pages of the Bible we don't like. But we need need to sit with it. These things are not confined to the pages of history. Just look at the world news at the moment, and we see the wickedness of the world and nations. If you're a traditional churchgoer, you'll be familiar with the creeds. Christians declare their faith regularly, sometimes every week, sometimes in some of your liturgies, yeah. Apostles' Creed, on the third day he rose again, he ascended into the heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. This is orthodox Christian belief declared by many churches around the world. The Nicene Creed is a slightly longer one. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures, He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And 
his kingdom will have no end. This is core belief. The judgment of God is core belief. And the image of the cup of God's wrath is there in the vision of the end times in the book of Revelation. Chapter 6, I'm going to be quick here. We find the kings of the earth hiding from the wrath of the Lamb. The wrath of the Lamb. This is Jesus, the Lamb of God. But the wrath of the Lamb, it doesn't sit easily, does it? Revelation 14, verse 9 and 10. A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives its mark on their forehead or on their hand, they too will drink, listen, the wine of God's fury, which has been poured out full strength into the cup of his wrath. The cup is not watered down in the New Testament. They drink it full strength, those who receive the mark of the beast. We're not going to try and interpret all of that now. We'll be here till supper time. We'll get the cocoa out. But the passage goes on in verse 19, we're talking about Revelation 14 here, to speak of the grapes of the earth being harvested. The angel swung the sickle of the earth, gathered its grapes and threw them into the great wine press. What? Of God's wrath. Woo. Did you notice, if you were reading verse 30 of our text, he will shout like those who tread the grapes. <laughs> People in the wine press, are probably, I mean, they didn't have the me- mechanisms at the time, but I guess if you're sloshing around, if Janet and I are busy in the kitchen, we can't hear each other, so you end up shouting, don't you, if the microwave's going round. And I guess in a wine press, you know, if you want to talk to your mate about the football or whatever, you have to shout. And God shouts like people in a wine press. Is that coincidence? I don't know. People treading grapes. The grapes of God's wrath appears in the book of Revelation. And what about the mysterious Babylon? Revelation 16, 19. God remembered Babylon the great and gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of his wrath. It's there. In chapter 18, we find Babylon again. And it's talks there of the nations who've drunk the maddening wine of her adultery. Babylon is portrayed as a harlot. And the next chapter refers to the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her adulteries. A mighty angel picked up a boulder the size of a large millstone and threw it into the sea and said, with such violence, the great city of Babylon will be thrown down, never to be found again. Babylon, not literal, but it speaks of sinful, rebellious people controlling nations. Was this Rome in John's mind? Not sure he ever knew in his lifetime. But remember, that was the great power that nobody ever thought would get overthrown. It did last quite a long time afterwards, but gradually dissolved away. But the kingdom of Jesus, the one they crucified, who died in apparent weakness, his kingdom goes on forever. We sing about earth's pride em- proud empires fade and die, don't we, in the day thou gavest, Lord, has ended. But his kingdom reigns and grows forever. I've forgotten the exact words of that verse. So these end time judgments in the book of Revelation do rather resonate, don't they, with Jeremiah 25. God's wrath is not confined to the Old Testament, to the Hebrew Scriptures. The same God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is the God who does not tolerate sin. And Hebrews 12, verse 25 says this, See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when refusing him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? And that's speaking, of course, about Jesus, who's mentioned in the previous verse, the one who is the mediator of a new covenant, whose blood speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. In other words, Jesus stands in the gap for us. His blood covers our sins. We must not refuse him, because in him is life, abundant life. He came announcing the kingdom of God, didn't he? The kingdoms come near, repent and believe. In other words, turn away from evil 
and turn to God. The time is here. And Hebrews 12 refers, you know, God the judge of all. God is the judge of all. This brings us just to pause in the Garden of Gethsemane with Jesus. He challenged James and John and said to them, can you drink the cup that I'm going to have to drink? And they said, oh yeah. Had they any idea what he was talking about? And Jesus cries out to his father, could the cup be taken from him? What was that cup? It's this one. The cup of God's wrath over evil and sin. Jesus is facing it, drinking it for us all, dying on the cross for our sakes. And finally he prays, Matthew 26, verse 42, My Father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. Jeremiah offered the cup to the nations. The Father offers the cup to his son Jesus. Drink it for the people of the world. It's the only way. It's the only way. He had to drink it to take upon himself the punishment for sin. This is the big picture of the Bible. And it makes sense of the cross. Some people say, you know, always lead to God. But if that's true, why on earth did Jesus have to die? He came to stand in the gap and make it possible that God, in all his holiness, could be approached that we could be called his children, not having our sins counted against us. Because of his grace, we can come to the throne. His blood atones for our sins and we are forgiven. May we never take it for granted, friends, the price Jesus paid. And Hebrews 12 ends with these words, and they're quite well known. Since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably and with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Gentle Jesus, meek and mild. Mm. He comes as judge. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. He's done it all for us, that we might be received and forgiven, but ultimately, we've got to decide. We've got to make up our minds. And these horrible stories of wickedness, that we find in the scriptures and the rebellion of God's own people and their own kind of idolatry and adultery really with other gods are a warning for us. We must take that seriously and recognise that we are placed in a wonderful spot because of Jesus and we're invited to put our trust in him. So let's do that in the quietness for a moment and then we've got the final song. Let me lead us in a closing prayer. Father God, we are troubled by this kind of thing, if we're honest. None of us finds it easy. Punishment, swords, death, wickedness, weeping and wailing, rolling in the dust. It just all feels so far from where we want to be. But these things are there as lessons for us. And we pray that we would learn from them and learn what it is to be your people and to be faithful to you. A God who is holy, true and upright, good to the core. And you want your people to be like that. Help us to respond, to be faithful, to be people that want to be reflecting your image in the world today. And Lord, would you forgive us for all the ways in which we fall short, how we wound one another, how we cause such hurt, sometimes unknowingly. Sometimes we deliberately do things that we know are so wrong. Father, forgive us. Thank you that Jesus took it all upon himself and he went to the grave and buried our sins in the ground and invites us to rise with him as new creations. 
Help us to know this good news and to live it out and to bring that message of hope to the people around us. May we be people that can celebrate because you've done a great and mighty thing for us. And you love the world so much that you gave your only son that whoever believes in him should not die and have everlasting life. Amen. I don't know about you, but I'm exhausted. We've got a song which is um, from Ren Collective, actually. It's called um, The Art of Celebration, but it begins with the words about uh, I come before the throne of grace. And it's just a beautiful song. If you don't know it, just let it minister to you. But let's um, join it. It's quite easy to pick up, actually. And it's, um, it's, yeah, a beautiful song that reminds us that we are able to access this beautiful place of healing and restoration. So let's sing as we close. By grace alone somehow I stand Where even angels fear to tread Invited by redeeming love Before the throne of God above He pulls me close With nail-scarred hands Into His everlasting arms When condemnation grips my heart and Satan tempts me to despair I hear the voice that scatters fear the great I am the Lord is here oh praise the one who fights for me and shields my soul eternally For I approach your throne Blameless now I'm running home By your blood I come Welcomed as your own Into Bye.
Lovely words to respond as we close together. Final words from the end of 2 Thessalonians. Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and every way. The Lord be with all of you. Amen. God bless you. You don't have nightmares, as Sean Taylor used to say.